Um, and now the day prof Glenda Gray has got this international, she's got an international profile. You talk about Glenda Gray and everybody who's in the HIV and AIDS or anybody who's who's in the vaccine trials, they will know who Glenda is. And I think she was also spearheading the coronavirus HIV. She's the one who conducted the research in South Africa. And she's been pushing that we get the, the, the all the three uh, doses of the vaccine. Glenda's global profile includes a role as a copy eye of the HIV vaccine trials network, a transitional collaboration for the development of HIV and AIDS prevention vaccine. She's also the director of the international program for the HIV vaccine trial network. And she's the chairperson of the board of the Global Alliance for Chronic Diseases. She is the member of the Institute of the Medicine of the National Academics in the USA. Prof. Gray received South Africa's higher, highest honor, the Order of Mapungubwe, for her pioneering the research in the prevention of mother to child transmission trials in South Africa and Africa. Other pre prestigious accolades include the Nelson Mandela Health and Human Rights Award for her significant, significant contributions in the field of mother to child transmission of HIV. She was selected as one of times 100 most influ influential people in the world. Glenda is a recognized leader in her field. Her qualifications include um, MBBCH, FCPs, DSC, uh, Onarian Cosa SFU. And please don't ask me what these acronyms mean because I've got no idea. <laughs> DSC, Onarian, and LLD at Rhodes. So let us come Prof. Gray as she does. It gets Thank you. Thank you, Brucey. Uh, can you hear me? I wasn't sure whether I should use my um, my earphones or whether I should just speak. If you can hear me, I'll just continue with the earphones. Is, is that fine? I just want to make sure you can hear me. Okay, it looks like you can hear me. Thanks, great. So um, Chancellor, Program Director, um, colleagues, both in person and online, all protocol observed, thank you for inviting me to talk today. I'm sorry I was going to be there in person, but I contracted COVID over the weekend. And so I'm here in my bedroom uh, under quarantine, and I hope to get out of it very soon, either tonight or tomorrow morning. But um, in the meantime, you know, I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. I just need you to just um I need to share my screen. So if um someone can just disable, can just enable me to share my screen, that'll be great. Thank you. There we are. Um are you able to see? Let me just get into are you able to see my screen? Yes. Hopefully, okay, great. So I'm going to to talk about uh the how science helped deal with the pandemic from a lens from South Africa and from the lens of a scientist as well as the head of the Medical Research Council and how he responded and the lessons learned. So I essentially have eight lessons that I've learned uh, during um, this COVID pandemic, which I'm going to share with you um, as we go forward. And I, I think Busi did mention this in her, in her um, description and a lot of people have before me, is that um, we were faced at the beginning of the pandi pandemic with a trade-off. Um, and Busi uh, mentioned flattening the curve or, or reducing the graph. And um, we had to balance um, the, the, the prevent, preventing loss of lives with preventing loss of livelihoods. And, um, and the, shut, the shutdowns and, uh, that we saw uh, were an attempt to prevent loss of life, but they also had a profound impact um, on, 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 on society um, as a whole. And we'll talk a little bit about those in the lessons learned. So in the beginning of the COVID pandemic, um, 
um, uh, around the time about the 5th of March, the Department of Science and Innovation DG approached me and he said, what is our strategy uh, for, for responding to the to COVID pandemic? And I was on an airplane um, going from, from Durban to Cape Town. And I sat in that, two, that one and a half to two hour um, airplane, drive, uh, airplane flight and I put together a, 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 a plan. And then I shared it with a lot of scientists in the, in the country to, to, to respond in, in a South African way. And the first thing that we knew was that there was at a global level, a uh, lack of diagnostics. So that was the first thing that we were worried about. We were also worried about um, the natural history of COVID in South Africa because we had a lot of HIV and, and, um, and TB uh, patients as well as a lot of comorbidities. And so we had to uh, put aside money to both do, do surveillance, diagnostics, and then also invest in therapeutics. Noting that we don't have a lot of money, uh, we, we, we quickly uh, freed up money and as well as got money from the Department of Science and Innovation, as well as um, collaborating at an international level. To, to make these decisions, because we had such a little, we didn't have, resources weren't um, abundant, we had to make sure that we did everything in a way that was transparent and, um, and, and consultative. So we established a bioethics advisory board. And this bioethics advisory board advised us on a lot of things, including designs of studies, um, placebos, um, you know, where to put our money and how to respond to certain things. So it is very important to have this advisory board. There were um, a group of ethicists from Africa and South Africa that, of, at, that we could pose our problems to and allow them to um, help us uh, figure out what to do. We also decided because we um, um, resources were limited was to collaborate internationally to accelerate vaccine research. We knew that we couldn't do vaccine research by ourselves. And very, very quickly, I was able to get um, to be an investigator on the COVPN, which was the BADA NIH funded uh, vaccine platform. Um, we also funded, according to agreed set of research priorities, with peer review to make sure that um, we, uh, we were transparent in our, in, our, in our allocation of funding. We also recognize the importance to work with advocacy and community structures, because some of the things were hard to discuss, the issues around placebo, um, access to vaccines afterwards, issues around drugs and therapeutics, and, and what having working with advocacy and community was very important. We worked closely with the regulators, particularly SARPRA, to make sure that we could expedite um, the research that we're doing in South Africa, not only with vaccines, but also with uh, diagnostics. And having multiple research ethics committees that were looking at our research helped to validate uh, the rigor and the ethics uh, approach that we took. So in terms of the lessons that I've learned, and I think South Africa's learned, uh, is, is one thing, and for future pandemics, this lesson one is the importance of surveillance. So very quickly, we set up a, a genomic surveillance platform, and this helped uh, to, to, to identify variants of, variants of concern as they emerged in a very timely fashion. We also saw the importance of looking at um, the, the CT thresholds, which is a marker when people do uh, nasogastric PCR testing, um, one can look at uh, viral load. And when CT thresholds go down, we know that, that uh, community viral load is increasing. And so these CT thresholds provide us as an early warning that new, new, uh, new um, uh, uh, um, waves are emerging. Excess deaths uh, was an important thing. In, so MRC uh, tracks excess, has been tracking excess deaths for many years. And this gave us the true picture of mortality during the pandemic. The establishing wastewater surveillance was also very important because this, be this became our early warning system and allowed us to, to notify districts, uh, uh, metros, and national and, and provincial uh, systems of, of, of the emergence of early um, volatility around viral load in the wastewater. And then obviously hospital surveillance was critical. We did not know the natural history. Uh, we did not know we have a youth bulge. We don't have many old people. So we didn't know what our pandemic was going to look like. And we couldn't compare it to other countries that had, a, had, had much older people. So this just shows you um, the importance of the surveillance. And yeah, you can see um, the, the story of our, um, of our pandemic. We've had five waves and we're emerging into a, 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 a sixth wave, which is probably um, uh, um, fueled at this moment by Omicron uh, BA5. And the, having, knowing what's fueling our, our waves allows us to, to, to increase our surveillance and to increase um, 
uh, uh, um, um, uh, a number of other things, in, in, including making hospitals aware so that they can prepare for pandemics. So hopefully, as we as we move on, uh, we 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 appear to be going into a state of indemnity, which which means low grade um, ongoing community transmission. And I guess we will be in this low grade community um, transmission with little spikes uh, for decades to come until we can find vaccines um, that prevent infection, and not just disease and hospitalization. Very important in terms of our surveillance is that we had, as the MRC, invested very early on in software to, to look at HIV and TB resistance. And we were able to quickly um, uh, move to uh, use this um, software to, to, to enable automatic SARS-CoV-2 variant typing. And um, we were able to, to analyze genomes. And we've also been able to um, ensure that this is used outside South Africa. So there are 29 countries using this um, the this, this system that we invested on very early, including 11 other African countries. As I mentioned before, we rapidly um, funded a network of laboratory scientists and academic institutions to, to start dealing with surveillance. And we were able to monitor the emergence and spread of the new SARS-CoV-2 variants to inform our responses. And basically, we were also able to, to work with WHO and international scientists all over the world to inform um, the emergence of new variants. And this is just um, the surveillance that, that is done at a global, at a country level. You can see we have, uh, we, we are able to, to um, include all people from um, all provinces in the surveillance. And this just gives you a, an indication of, of um, the various provinces and the genomes that they're picking up and the, um, and the, um, and what, and what, what um, variants of concern is emerging. So as of now, we are mostly dominated by the Omicron BA4, BA5 uh, variants of concern. And you can see um, the change in time. In June, it was mostly uh, BA4 um, and, and, and a bit of BA5. In July, we saw again BA5 predominating as compared to BA4. And now we see that BA5 is a predominant um, uh, variant of concern, but we see other little um, variants emerging like um, XAY, and um, and we need to keep an eye on that. So that's an important. Um, it helps us uh, understand um, how the how the virus is evolving and the impact it has on on everything. So I just want to acknowledge this this wonderful group who've done amazing things and um, enabled us to be sometimes ahead of the curve at an international level on understanding the the evolution of the virus. Important uh, lesson from this. Um, genomic surveillance is the importance of um, of collaboration and sharing data at a, at a global level. And this is what's helped us enormously at, at a global level is the sharing of data. Important in terms of cycle, cycle um, CT threshold. So, so as I mentioned before, um, all viral loads um, from PCRs are monitored and uh, we are able to look at a uh, um, community viral load. And when the, and when the CT threshold start to go down, it's an indication that uh, the, the community viral load is going up and we need to then um, increase our, our surveillance to make sure that there's no um, new emergence of um, a variant. Looking at the excess deaths, the MRC publishes on a weekly basis, the excess deaths in the country. So we, we are able to say that more than 320,000 people have died in South Africa uh, during the pandemic, much more than, than, than that's been notified um, from people who've tested. And so we were able to, to show that we had probably one of the highest mortality, ra mortality rates in the world um, during the pandemic. And this is, um, um, quite, this is quite well uh, articulated in this paper that shows um, our high rates of, case of, of, of COVID-19 related mortality and showing us as one of the um, the highest countries affected uh, by this, despite uh, the fact that we thought we got off um, lightly. So South Africa has paid a huge price in the loss of lives for this hybrid immunity that we have that enables us to see a decoupling of cases from hospitalizations and deaths. And yeah, you can see it in this slide is that um, the importance of, of monitoring that the hospital admissions is that we're able to see this decoupling um, that we saw during um, the emergence of Omicron that um, the, the, the rates of death and hospitalizations had been decoupled from the cases, which was re very reassuring and, and probably a result of our hybrid immunity. Um, high rates of, we have high rates of exposure to SARS-CoV-2 more than 
90% of people in our country have been exposed, and we have about um, um, a moderate vaccine um, coverage as well, which which is um, uh, um, which has contributed to this this decoupling that we see over here. Very important for us in the in the beginning of every wave, we we evaluate um, 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 hospital admissions and deaths to try and get a feeling of um, what this wave is going to do, and this is what we this is what we do in, in every in the first four weeks of every. Um, uh, pandemic, we try and compare deaths and hospitalizations to see uh, the way we're going. And now you can see the importance of this data because it shows you the decoupling um, of deaths and hospitalizations um, as we emerge into the Omicron related um, area. Also important for us was to understand the mortality um, in countries and what is predicting it. And yeah, you can see if we compare the risk factors for mortality to provinces, and we, we use Western Cape as a province, you can see that the Eastern Cape um, had twice the risk of dying as compared to the Western Cape and um, and Limpopo 1.7 times. So you can see that which provinces are, are um, mostly affected by poor um, health systems, but um, the risk of dying is marked um, if you are in the Eastern Cape. And also, um, in, if you compare wave one, um, definitely wave two, which was the beta wave, um, in, had an increased risk of dying. And then again, quite sadly, if you compare the public sector to the private sector, people who, who access the, the public sector are one and a half times more likely to die than people in the public sector. Uh, than, yeah, in the public sector. If you have a look at age groups again, like the rest of the world, um, people over 60 were 20 times more likely to die and people over 80, 30. And again, also showing you the, the 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 disparities in health is that compared to 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 white people, um, uh, black Africans, coloured and people from Indian descent were more likely to have adverse outcomes as compared to to white people, reflecting the socioeconomic structure and dispar health disparities in our country. If you had a look at other things, we could also yes see um, the relationship of hypertension, diabetes, um, chronic cardiac disease as well as malignancy and TB and HIV on the risk of dying and showing you the relationship of our comorbidities, particularly infectious comorbidities like TB and HIV, um, increasing the risk of dying. Here's another, uh, some more data coming out of the Western Cape that again identifies the important role that um, TB and HIV had um, on um, affecting mortality and uh, reconfirming our fear that um, these uh, people who are immunosuppressed were more likely to die, but also shows you again, like other parts of the world, the role of diabetes, age, and 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 hypertension on on the risk of dying. Important also is um, in the important issues around hospitalizations is that by doing these hospitalization surveillance, we were also able to look at uh, certain um, groups of, of interest, and this includes children. And there's always a concern as new emerge, as new um, uh, variants emerge, is um, will this affect children uh, more than that, the previous wave? And this is just data showing um, the importance of, of hospital um, uh, surveillance. Looking at um, hospital-related hospital utilization, I just wanted to show you the, the cost of COVID-19 um, uh, in RANDs, um, in, depending on where you are in the, in the country. And you can see that um, if you were older than 65, uh, the cost, um, the median cost per patient was about 83,000 RAND as compared to around 24,000 RAND if you were under 18. If you were male, the cost, uh, median cost was about 60,000 60, RAND as compared to women around 50,000 RAND. If you have a look at the, the different provinces, so despite the fact that we had huge rates of mortality in the Eastern Cape, you can see that, um, that the cost per, per, per patient was 48,000 Rand, um, which was more than the Western Cape that had the best outcomes. In Gauteng, the cost was around 54,000 Rand, and, um, in, um, and in, in, in Limpopo, around 36,000 Rand. So you can see these are important things. So when we look at at um, uh, case fatality rates, outcomes, um, you can see that um, it, isn't, it, does, it doesn't mean by throwing money at the problem, um, you'll have better outcomes as is evidenced by what we saw coming out of the Western Cape. Looking at our wastewater surveillance very early on, the MRC and the NICD established wastewater surveillance to um, act as an early warning system. And this surveillance is being used um, in 77 wastewater 
uh, treatment plants in four provinces and involves four historically disadvantaged institutions. It's helped us develop a lot of skills and capacity development, and we're now establishing expertise in monkeypox and measles. This has helped us to track variants of, uh, of concern in our wastewater and to look for, for new, um, new, new pathogens that may emerge. This is just showing you our expansion into historically disadvantaged institutions, and this is us uh, opening up our lab at our University of Zululand. Lesson two um, was the investment in diagnostics. And yeah, you can see the importance of the monitoring of CT values, which was led by Leslie Scott at WITS. WITS can be very proud of, of all the work they do, Chancellor, as you can see. Um, this having, having these um, a continuous monitoring of CT values um, and looking at it twice a week helps us respond to the pandemic. Bavesh Khanna um, grew SARS-CoV-2. Bavesh Khanna is a TB um, a, a scientist and uh, we needed um, SARS-CoV-2 virus to help um, uh, to establish national controls. And Bavesh himself grew this virus and this has helped, um, uh, we've been able to deploy these controls um, to 26 countries. And because of him, and the work that he did, we were able to develop and scale PCR-related uh, diagnostics um, in our country. So again, VITS leading the way. And then we were also able to develop a lot of points of care and, um, and diagnostic reagents in South Africa. And this involved fast tracking this. We worked very closely with SARPRA and were able to use um, the VITS NHL reference lab um, to, to basically um, uh, uh, get get um, diagnostics to market. So again, the role of WITS in, in this is very important. We were able to also um, improve surge testing and we used a lot of H historically disadvantaged institutions to help us. And these academic labs were, 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 were put up and were able to help um, when the public sector faltered and, and also to establish research capability um, in, in places where we weren't able to do it before. Lesson three was um, learning about the investment in vaccines and therapeutics. So because South Africa didn't have a lot of money, we, we partnered to look at both treatment and, um, and vaccine trials. And we were able to fund the first uh, vaccine trial in South Africa, which is run by Shabu Mahdi, who is at Wits University. Um, we were also able to leverage our, our international stature and work together with J&J in a multi-centered study that evaluated, evaluated the single dose at 26. And we were also able to use this as the backbone of our, the first part of our, 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 our vaccine rollout, which was the Sasanki study. And we were able to do this um, because of our, 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 we were able to secure half a million doses and help the national rollout um, when it faltered and give the healthcare workers access to the single dose of, of A26. We were able to give uh, just, just under half a million people this, we were able to then boost them at about a quarter, about a half, a quarter of a million, um, we were able to boost and we were able to demonstrate that these vaccines were working against both um, beta and, and delta and Omicron. We were also able to compare um, the A26 uh, uh, vaccine program with the Pfizer vaccine program and show um, um, how these vaccines were working in the field in our country ahead of most people in, at, at a global level. And this just shows you some additional data. We were able to, to reassure again the country that the vaccines were, were effective. Um, we've been able to do further work um, boosting um, the, the Sasanki participants with both Pfizer and now with Moderna. We were able to also look at, at fractionated or half doses of, of J&J and Pfizer as a way of trying to spare vaccine and also now working with a whole lot of other people uh, to look at um, better, better vaccine options going forward. Lesson four was to invest in basic science and we were able to fund people doing um, pseudovirus and live virus assays and um, immunology to help us understand um, how our vaccines were working um, in, our, in our communities. And this was a very important thing. It showed um, how, how everybody was responding to the vaccines and helped inform our vaccine rollout. And this just shows you, um, we followed healthcare workers and, and looked at their immune responses and were able to look about the cross recognition of the the, um, the the vaccine to to new emerging um, variants. Lesson five: We heard when when vaccine rollout happened, um, we were South Africa found itself in a very precarious position because we didn't have vaccine, and we looked around and we realized that there were very little vaccine capability on the African continent, 
And so we looked at how to invest in vaccine development and to become part of the mRNA technology transfer hub that's developing a local vaccine. And we've been working with Wits University and Afrigen to establish a the um, Afrigen mRNA vaccine, which we hope to put into humans um, next year. And this is just the process, how we were able to leverage everything that we do um, using our um, using CRISP, the NICD and VITS, um, and all the work with others to get um, to a stage where we're able to do clinical trials um, and work um, in, in and, and develop a vaccine capability. Lesson six was to invest in capacity development. And very soon we found out if we are gonna do vaccine manufacturing, we have a, a paucity of skilled workforce in the biomanufacturing biomanuf sector in South Africa. And we've been able to work with Patrick Sun Chiong and get 100 million to invest in developing um, this program in South Africa. And there will be, um, and, and basically we, we've estimated that we need over 600 scientists, uh, skilled scientists, and as well as technicians who, who can help us in these factories. And we've just now advertised um, for, um, for scholarships that have just come out to do this work. Lesson seven was um, as a, um, trying to understand that we made sure we understood the, um, the human toll um, in a pandemic. And this is the, the issue around the, the loss of livelihoods that I spoke about. Um, we saw at a global level, both in South Africa and even in the US, um, food insecurity and that people were, there was household hunger and there was child hunger, um, which was very important to see the impact of our, our strategies on, on, on household in, food insecurity. And even in the US, we saw that there was um, insecurity when it came to, to, to food. Um, we also saw uh, the, the the impact of of our lockdowns on on school going, and um, and about 616 million children um, still remain affected by school closures. In terms of low and middle income countries, um, we, um, school learning losses have left up to 70% of 10 year olds un unable to read or understand a simple text, um, up from 53% pre pandemic. And in, in Brazil, we see three and four children in grade two are off track in reading, up from one to two in the pre-pandemic, and um, lots of children who are reporting they're not planning to go back to school once their school reopen. In South Africa, um, children were are about, um, uh, we saw about, um, they are about 75% to a full year behind where they should be, and um, around 400 to 500,000 children have dropped out of school uh, between March 20 and March 20 and March 2020 and and July 2021, so a huge impact on on school and also we know from from high, uh, from um, high institution the lack of contact learning has also impacted the ability of um, tertiary students to really enjoy their 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 um, the university experience. Loss of jobs, we've seen a huge loss of jobs at a global level. In lesson eight, um, for me, is investing in protecting the healthcare worker and the health system. And so um, for what we saw, the, the huge, um, the people, the frontline workers were our healthcare workers. And what we saw at a global level, um, this uh, winter of despair and this huge loss of life um, amongst healthcare workers. Um, in South Africa, we, we think around four, um, just under 5,000 healthcare workers lost their life. And this is probably an, an underestimate. But what we also saw that we were unable to protect our healthcare worker. There was a lack of direction and coordination. Uh, we were running out of oxygen and beds in the, in the first part of the pandemic. There was a high workload. Our healthcare workers faced wave after wave and they had to, and they had to deal with both vaccinated and unvaccinated patients. There was a lack of PPE and we saw discrepancy between nurses and, and doctors. We saw, we see huge mental health problems and post-traumatic stress disorder with people leaving um, the, the clinical medicine. Um, during the pandemic, we saw low social acceptance and stigma and uh, nurses and doctors not being able to put their kids in school and, and nursery school because people were scared that they would get um, um, COVID from, from this. And then um, not only did um, the healthcare workers had to deal with, with loss of their own patients, but they had to deal with bereavement and loss of peers, family members, and friends. And so a huge toll on our healthcare workers. We also saw a lack of resilience um, of the healthcare sector at a global level. This just shows you both in, in, um, in India and in South Africa, 
that we 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 we, we there was a um, a, um, decline in the number of HIV and TB diagnostics that we've got, and, and we haven't managed to get back to pre-COVID levels. We saw corruption and the misuse of public funds, things that should have gone to, to, gone to PPE, and we saw a huge amount of, of corruption, not only in South Africa, but also in other parts of the world. So just in summary, you know, COVID has demonstrated the need for and achieved a massive global collaborative scientific effort um, with rapid dissemination and sharing of research results and data. South African researchers um, used their ex existing expertise towards COVID. They leveraged a decade of investments in projects and platforms. We were able to reallocate and raise money that could go to uh, COVID research and investment. And we also saw a lot of non-traditional funders that emerged. Um, it taught us the need to, to establish capacity for local manufacture of PPE and other medical devices diagnostics and vaccines, and this has been accelerated on all fronts. It also we also saw the need for collaboration, cooperation, agility, and rapid, and rapid response, and this has been achieved on an unprecedented scale in South Africa. Um, these issues, uh, these lessons, capacity, and new ways of working must be harnessed and used um, to, to perpetuate the games uh, that we made uh, during this pandemic. And COVID has also demonstrated the need to document the impact of pandemics on society and, and human well-being. So I'm going to end by just saying, hopefully in the future, when we look at a future pandemic framework, um, we need to, imp the importance of surveillance, um, the importance of independent and transparent investigations into origin, making sure that the healthcare worker is protected and the health system is resilient, to make sure that our strategies don't impede economic activities and schooling and prevent corruption, and that we invest in vaccines um, as well as make sure that we pay attention to human well-being and mental health support. So I was going to end with this quote that uh, just saying that uh, Louis Pasteur once said that science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and is the torch which will illuminate the world. And certainly this has done that in this in this COVID pandemic. I want to acknowledge all the healthcare workers, you know, that um, have braved this. And, um, and also the, the healthcare workers that we lost during the pandemic. And I'm gonna end there and thank you very much for, for everything. And I'm sorry that I can't be there in person. I'm happy to take questions. Amazing amount of work. Uh, what a wonderful example of how uh, governments, researchers uh, and communities can come together and solve uh, practical problems. Uh, so thank you for the work that you've done and uh, thank you for this uh, wonderful presentation. You know, one of the things that it shows is how experience that we shared in parallel um and uh and and you know um so yeah i'm gonna open the floor to questions uh i have a roving microphone does somebody want to ask the first question uh I, I will break the ice and um and ask you two questions uh one is resistance you know, you've told a wonderful story of, you know, uh, how you put things together and how things worked well. But uh, I just wonder if you could talk about points of resistance uh, and um, uh, from both governments or communities or um, uh, researchers, as well to the kind of work that you did as a takeaway that um, uh, we can understand. The other point is about internationalism you know how much did you feel like you were out here on your own or uh, um you know or how much of your experience was in uh conversation with institutions from all over the world as well uh you know because one of the odd things about this experience is that we all shared it but there were so many barriers between us in terms of uh policy practice um and approach so if uh, you could talk to those two points so that would be Fantastic. Sure. I'll start with the the last one first. So in the beginning of the pandemic, oh, just um, just sorry, just one second. We're going to change the sound. Okay, sorry. So I'm going to start with the last question first. So 
during the, during the part of early part of the pandemic, we did find ourselves completely isolated. At a global level, there was a shortage of both diagnostics um, and PPE, and there were literally um, uh, fights, um, you know, to secure PPE at a global level. And obviously, if you're a poor country, you you left out, you know, to to getting your PPE quite late. And so we did we did um, with our shutdown, we were unable to to bring in material. And at a global level, there were there were huge um, um, uh, kind of fights to get um, the the diagnostics, the PCR, and that's why we had to find our own our own um, uh, to to scale up our own um, PCR. So I think at a global level, we have to make sure that there is there is equity um, around diagnostic access and protection for healthcare workers, or otherwise we have to make sure that um, at a, at, a, at an individual level. Um, we are uh, we protect ourselves or protect you know, we create nationalism in a way because of of the the lack of access. So I think in the beginning there was a lot of isolation, and you know we did suffer from that because we were unable to scale up testing and, and unable to protect our healthcare workers. Um, I think uh, um, where we did collaborate quite quite largely was with um, the, our information. We had real time information sometimes um, ahead of anyone else. And so we could have calls with the NIH, with Australia, with Britain, um, with WHO, and we could we could tell them, you know, what variant was happening. We could share the the genomic structure, and we could also we also had uh, real real time data on hospitalizations. And so we would have weekly me uh, meetings with 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 our U.S. counterparts and other counterparts, and we're able to give them, you know, day by day account of how the um, how the pandemic was unfolding, particularly um, with Omicron and with um, with Beta and as well as Delta. So we we were always three or four weeks ahead of anyone else in terms of our, our surges, and so that provided a lot of information. Um, I think what we, what the the greatest part of of the pandemic was the willingness of scientists to share. Um, so I think that was important. The third part that was that showed like the issue around. Um, uh, nationalization, nationalization obviously was like vaccine that. access and that um, a lot of the countries were um, uh, particularly third world countries or uh, um, um, you know the continent the Af African continent was left um, behind the rest of the world in terms of vaccine access which leads to I guess a, a couple of other things around um, uh, for, to which goes to your first question was around uh, resistance and I think our biggest um, challenge at, on, on the African continent has been around vaccine hesitancy and how um, very quickly conspiracy theories um, have, 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 have flown in here. And mostly it's probably related to the lack of trust of the health system, lack of trust of healthcare workers, lack of trust of the government. And this certainly impacted on, on vaccine rollout and, um, and something that we need to address. We need to improve the trust of government and the trust of of um of people in 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 medical science and also find ways of of being proactive in dealing with conspiracy theories and um and anti-vaxxer sentiments. Um, just to follow up on that as well. Sorry, I got some feedback in here. Just one second. <laughs> there is nothing worse than hearing yourself. Uh, um, uh, is that this infrastructure that has been uh, built up to um, uh, during this COVID pandemic? Is that infrastructure transferable in the sense of um, you know uh, what may come in the future? Um, are there the kind of funding concerns for uh, dealing with the tail end of the pandemic now uh, and being prepared for? Um, uh, pandemics in the future. Uh, what is the future of these institutions and the kind of relationships that have been built during this period? That's a good question. So um, South Africa has leveraged off its decades of um, HIV and TB, um, both laboratory and clinical infrastructure. And so we had a very well functioning clinical research capability as well as um, laboratories had been working on pseudovirus and live virus assays for HIV, and uh, we had also um, invested heavily in um, uh, looking at TB and HIV resistance. And so we were able to 
to move very rapidly, use all our infectious disease scientists um, who responded both in the clinic and in, um, in the laboratory. So having that infrastructure is important and hopefully will bode us well for the future. Investing in, in the wastewater surveillance will be important for, for future um, surveillance. And you know we intend to continue to support wastewater surveillance because not only can we do that, does it help us with uh, looking at um, uh, SARS-CoV-2, but we can pick up things like polio and measles um, particularly at a, at a local level and also things like antiretrovirals or drugs that can also help with, with drug tracking. So it could have a, a, um, another, another impact on that. Um, in terms of, of what we need to watch out for is the issue around health system resilience. So in terms of the science, you know, I think we, 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 well, um, we well capacitated. But what we did see um, and what we are seeing is, you know, we have a, we have a health system that is just not resilient. And um, and we need to be able to in the future have a health system that 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 uh, nothing impacts it. Um, it has to be resilient enough to basically not stop operating or stop treating cancer, or you know, or preventing the rollout of ARVs. And so um, and we also have to have a much more um, we have to have support to our human capital in the health system and make sure that um, they valued. And 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 treated well. So for me, um, uh, what I worry about in the future is how to maintain a you know a health system during a pandemic, and how to make sure that um, we don't drop the ball on other important diseases when we're responding to a pandemic. Important in that in our health system resilience is that we have to stop corruption in our health system. We we are we do have enough money in our health system. And if we could get rid of the, the irregular spending, the fruitless and wasteful expenditure and the corruption, um, we could do a lot better. You know, so I think if we could just make sure that our finances you know, are protected and go to where they would be, um, we would have a thriving health system. A check from the audience. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gray. We really appreciate everything that we learned today, and it's very consistent with a lot of the information we've seen. And we're great. It's great to see similar strategies applied in South Africa as well, especially in comparisons to the U.S., which is where we come from. Um, one of the things that we have seen in the U.S. is complacency. As uh, somebody eloquently stated, maybe we are done with COVID-19, but it's not done with us. How do you maintain that? resilience, but also vigilance more so moving forward where individuals are just tired of it. And especially with some of the cases in the waves going down, us being much more comfortable moving forward uh, with uh, less protections and that leading to potentially more dire consequences moving forward that are avoidable. So that complacency that we're seeing in the United States, I'm imagining it's not just there, it's, it's worldwide. So if you want to tell us a little bit more about uh, its impact in South Africa and what are the plans moving forward or how to deal with that? Is it campaign strategies, communication strategies? Not really sure, but would love to hear from you. Thank you. Yes, thanks. I mean, that's a great question. It has to be communication. Um, and yes, there is COVID fatigue and everybody um, has, you know, wants to get back to their normal lives. But I think the issue is, um, so the way one can mitigate that is, is communication. So we need to continue to communicate about this. And we also need to look at our, our vaccine strategies. Um, we're not boosting frequently enough. Um, you know, we just looked at recent data that shows that probably we've been, we should be vaccinating every four, every four months. And, um, and so we need to continue to make sure that we get frequent boosts and that we also introduce um, new vaccines that can try and prevent infection. Otherwise, you know, we're going to add um, SARS-CoV-2 to um, influenza, RSV, um, I don't know, you know, so we, uh, we're going to have another uh, virus to contend with every year or twice a year. Um, you know, I, I've had three vaccinations. Um, my last vaccination was in March, so it means it's, it's six months since my last vaccination. And yeah, I'm sitting with, with, with COVID which means that um, I need to be vaccinating more frequently. Um, and, you know, and I think that's an important thing. So we need better vaccines and we need good communication. And we need to use the vaccines that we do have 
and um, we need to continue to be vigilant. Um, the surveillance is important, um, and you know, using that surveillance, we can also do um, early early warnings to to people. And we were on a call. I was on a call yesterday where we were just reviewing the data and just uh, feel that um, we're just not communicating enough at this moment about um, SARS-CoV-2. And um, how do you keep people engaged? And I think that's a, a huge issue around um, communication strategy. You know, how do we keep people engaged? Um, how do we make sure people go and get their vaccines? And how do we make sure that um, that uh, we understand that this is this this uh, SARS-CoV-2 is going to be with us for decades, and it's another virus we're going to have to contend with um, twice a year. Okay. Uh, <laughs> see, my uh, technical skills are, uh, are terrible. Uh, do we have any more questions? From yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gray, for that fascinating uh, presentation. Um, you talk about the resilience of the healthcare system. Um, I'm, and, and, and I see that uh, there's lots of work being done on vaccines. I'm wondering, uh, how, how could we be preparing our healthcare workers uh, to, res uh, to, res um, to respond to future pandemics? Um, just from a training perspective, um, I wonder if you could, if you have any thoughts around that. Thank you. Yeah, I think our healthcare workers are the most important um, early warning system. They, you know, they are the canary in the coal mine because they are the people that are seeing stuff is on the ground. And so, um, long before um, you know, um, people pick up it's in wastewater or um, the clinician is important because um, people will come will come to the hospital and um, will say something is different. Exactly what happened in in China. It was the healthcare worker that actually picked up that something was different. There was an atypical pneumonia that they couldn't explain. And so I think um, we have to make sure that the healthcare worker understands their, their integral and critical value um, in, in, in alerting um, um, uh, the government into what's happening. And so I think we have to train healthcare workers in, in, in early detection. We have to set up systems in the hospital that people are looking and seeing, oh, something is happening here. You know, what's this? I'm seeing an unusual uh, hospital admissions. And, um, and, and I think that's an important part. So I think in terms of um, education, maybe we do need to look at introducing modules, not only for um, doctors and nurses, but also for health managers and the health system so that there's a way that um, one can detect strange things that are happening or hospitalizations that are that are unusual and have a, have a system where healthcare workers, clinicians can, um, you know, ring the bell uh, when things are, are strange, just like we saw in, in China. But also we need to know that uh, these people will also be protected. Um, you know, we know that um, uh, healthcare workers who raised the alarm in China faced, um, you know, um, a lot of a lot of adversity for that, and so um, there also has to be a way of of encouraging information and um, and not and not and not being punitive if you are the person that's that's alerting the system. So I think it's an important question, and it's, it speaks to the importance of surveillance, epidemiology, and human rights in a way as well, because um, sometimes um, people that are alerting the system face um, the side effects of that. And so um, I think, you know, the healthcare worker is a important uh, tool in this whole endeavor. Um, and um, we can't underestimate how important they are and how we need to also protect them, um, not only from new pathogens, but from what might happen if they raise the alarm. And so I think it's a, it, it's a good module to put in and maybe, um, like we have GCP, good clinical practice, maybe it should be a, a CME thing where um, um, you know we we train people on on this. So it's a good it's a good um, thing that you raise, and uh, and we have to try and understand how we get this into the into the curriculums, but also into practice in in South Africa. 
Hey, thank you. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Just right at the front here. Uh, good morning, and, and thank you very much, Linda, for the, your presentation. Towards the end of the presentation, you mentioned that we still have people that are in denial, and we've got those conspiracy theories that make people not go for vaccines. And this is a reality. However, being a reality of, of, of the situation on the ground, it's uh, one I, I think the question for me is, what strategies do we have or plans, you know, to, 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 to bring the people on board? That's one. And secondly, once we have uh, the, the, the negative that is, is, is happening on the ground, whatever, whether it's true or it's false, it does impact on, 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 on service delivery. So every weekend when I'm, I attend a funeral in the township, if a person died, they'll say, you know, it's only the person that are vaccinated that are dying. And, <laughs> and, and yeah, and, 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 and for them, it's a reality that they are living. It's their lived experience that if, if, if my father didn't vaccinate, you would still be alive. And I didn't vaccinate, look at me. And, 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 and how then do we go about, because when we were in the crisis mode, we had the scientists on our screens every day, you know, helping people to understand. And now that we are not in the crisis mode, but we are still in the crisis mode because people are not vaccinating and we are not communicating. What is your take on that? And what, what's the plan going forward? Thanks. I think it's an important observation. So um, uh, Busi, you can make the diagnostic you can produce the antiviral, you can make the vaccine, and you can learn to treat something. But what we have to do is also is, is to change um, humans as well. And that's more, that's harder, that's more harder than to make a vaccine. Um, and how, you know, how do we, you know, how do we influence people? And this is the role of, you know, social science, anthropology, sociology, um, the understanding of the human, human behavior and using um, those lessons. Um, to address the the stuff that are harder to um, to change, um, and you know, we I guess we see this in HIV. Um, we have HIV incidences that we had that um, we saw in 1996. We have PrEP, um, we have ARVs, and yet people are still getting infected. And so, um, changing human behavior is, I guess, the um, the uh, the hardest thing to do, um, but the most necessary if we want to impact on pandemics. And I'm trying to understand, you know, the drivers um, of this um, and trying to influence, you know, so I guess one, you know, a key, key influences, um, uh, you know, so we have to understand the drivers of change and, and use those tools. And this is where, um, you know, me as a doctor, you know, uh, that we know we need to all work together. It's okay for us to make vaccines or diagnostics, as I said, um, but it's another story to to change um, the worldview of people. And that's gonna be the most important endeavor that we have to do, be it HIV um, or, or SARS-CoV-2. Uh, Professor Gray, I uh, would like to thank you for all the work that you've done. Um, thank you for presenting this morning in the conditions <laughs> that uh, you face today. But it, it's another example of uh, how we uh, keep on soldiering on, uh, finding ways to communicate, um, educate, uh, and um, uh, try and create a better world. So thank you very much for your presentation. We'll give you a round of applause. Thank you. Okay, so for everybody who is left in the room right now, uh, we'll be going to a coffee.